I want to invite you to open your Bible to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 21, 2 Samuel chapter 21, I want to read the first 10 verses, beginning in verse 1, now there, I am reading from the New American Standard Version. So if you have that, it'll follow along real good. If you have King James, then you'll be able to recognize it. And if you have the NIV, uh, you'll, you'll catch it as well. Now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David sought the presence of the Lord. And the Lord said, It is for Saul and his bloody house, because he has put the Gibeonites to death. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not of the sons of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the sons of Israel made a covenant with them, but Saul sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah. Thus David said to the Gibeonites, What should I do for you? How can I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? God had told him the reason this famine is on the land is because Saul killed the Gibeonites. And so David comes and wants to make atonement with the Gibeonites. Verse 4, Then the Gibeonites said to him, We have no concern of silver or gold with Saul, or of his house, nor is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. And he said, I will do for you whatever you say. So they said to the king, The man who consumed us and who planned to exterminate us from remaining with any border of Israel, let seven men of his sons be given to us, and we will hang them before the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of the Lord. And the king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of an oath with the Lord, of the Lord, which was between them, between David and Saul's son, Jonathan. So the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aah, Ammoni, and Mephibosheth, whom she had borne to Saul, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she had borne to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholite. And she gave them to the hand, and he gave them to the hands of the Gibeonites. And they hanged them in the mountain before the Lord, so that seven of them fell together, and they were put to death in the first days of the harvest at the beginning of the barley harvest. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, of Ai took sackcloth and spread it for herself on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest until it rained on them from the sky. And she allowed neither the birds of the sky to rest on them by day, nor the beast of the field by night. Now here is a story, perhaps you haven't read it in a long time, that the nation Israel was undergoing some hard days because 
King Saul had mistreated the Gibeonites and had killed them. He had made a covenant with them that they were going to be safe, and then he violated his own covenant. And God is holding the whole nation accountable for what happened. Why does this happen? There's a guy that you have seen his picture in the paper, I'm sure, many times. He's a columnist, syndicated columnist, named Victor Rozell. His articles are carried in many papers nationwide. The man always has a pair of shades on when he look at his picture. Several years ago, he was writing about corruption and the dirt and the labor, the dirt in the labor unions, how they were so corrupt and they were robbing the people that were members of the union. It was a big investigation of the labor unions and Rozell was publishing all this. He was walking down the street going to work one morning and a young guy come running up to him and pulled the lid off of a bottle and smashed the bottle right into his face. It was full of sulfuric acid. And the sulfuric acid covered all of his face, into his eyes, on his clothes, everywhere. And for weeks, Roselle was in agony and pain and the doctors were trying to save his eyesight and they couldn't. Roselle was blinded by this attack. But after he had recovered, he was determined that he was gonna continue his work as a columnist and so he continued on. He got about six million pieces of mail sympathizing with him. People praying that they might catch the hoodlum that done this. People offered eye transplants if they would have been possible. Millions of dollars were contributed to a fund that would guarantee that there would be a reward if you turned this guy in for what he had done to Roselle. Several years went by and there was no solution to the crime. One day the police fished the body out of the river and they looked at this body and noticed that it had burns all on the hands on the face and they realized that it was the same look that acid produces on a body and they investigated and they determined that this young man who was killed and thrown in the river was the one who had splashed the sulfuric acid in Victor Brazil's face. Somebody had paid him off. You know, the whole upshot of it, your sins will find you out. God says that. He says for to each one of us that we will answer to the Lord for the deeds done in the flesh. And that's what this passage is about here in 2 Kings chapter 21. There's a crisis in the nation. Phantom of, of a famine had come. There was no rain. It was a drought and the crops had failed and the livestock was suffering and people were hard pressed to make a living. And David, the king, comes to God and says, God, why is this? And God laid it on the line. He said, it's because of what Saul did to the Gibeonites and you're going to have to square the account with the Gibeonites before this is all straightened out. And so Saul called the Gibeonites and he said, what is it that I can do? 
that we can make it right so that God can again bless the nation. And the Gibeonites said, we don't want you to kill anybody for what's been done. And we don't want you to give us money. We're not in it to collect any bounty on this. And David said, well, what do you want? And they said, we want you to give us seven sons of Saul. The one who exterminated almost the Gibeonites. And we want to deal with these seven sons of Saul. He said, I'll do it. And so he gave them seven sons of Saul. It says he gave two of the sons of a lady who was married to Saul named Rizpah. And he gave them five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul. And they took those seven young men. And it says they hung them up on the mountain before God. They took a rope and they hung them up, strung them up. And it says they hung them up in the beginning of the barley harvest until the rain started falling at the conclusion of the barley harvest. If you figure, according to the agriculture of that day, that was nearly four months. So they take these seven young men and hang them by the neck. And they're hanging up there for nearly four months. What a gruesome sight. How terrible. And it says, and Rizpah, who was the mother of two of them, got her some sackcloth, that's kind of like a toe sack, like burlap. And she spread it out on a rock, and she sat down on the rock. And she had some other cloths with her, no doubt. And when the birds would fly down to peck on the bodies of these men hanging there, she would get out and shoo the birds away. And at night she would stay there, lest the beast, the coyotes, the wolves, the cats, come and attack the bodies and consume them. And so she stayed there, day and night, watching these bodies and trying to protect the bodies. What a gruesome sight. Now, Rizpa, we can ask, why are you doing this? Why are you doing it? It's bad enough to lose your sons. Why are you torturing yourself, watching their bodies swing at the end of a rope and trying to keep the buzzards and the wild animals from consuming their bodies? Why do you keep doing it? Four months she's out there. She says, how can I do anything else? These were my sons. I loved them. I gave birth to them. I nursed, nursed them at my breast. I took care of them when they were sick. I saw them take their first steps. I heard their first voice, the words that they spake. And I, I watched over them and I saw them grow to young manhood. And they were all I had. Saul is dead. My sons are dead. And I'm here out of respect for my son. Well, I'm here because of a mother's love. I can't do anything else. I can't go away and let them pick the carcass and tear it to pieces. Abraham Lincoln made this statement. He said, all that I am or ever hope to be 
I owe to my darling mother. Lincoln was a great man, folks. And he said it was because I had a mother like that. A woman goes into labor. I've heard someone say they descend very down close to the shadow of death. Their body opens up, they give birth to a child, and they make that ascension back to life with a baby in their arms. Perhaps that's an exaggeration, I don't know. But I found an interesting verse of scripture, Jeremiah 30, chapter, 30th chapter, verse 5, it says, For I have heard a sound of terror, of dread. There is no peace. Ask now if a male can give birth. And he goes on to say, a man is in a hopeless situation if he was expecting a child because he wouldn't be able to deliver. And Jeremiah says, I see a man with his hands on his loins as a woman in childbirth, and why do all the faces turn pale? I can imagine you have turned pale. A man can't do that. God didn't equip it to be that way. But sometimes men folks minimize motherhood. They minimize the pain of childbirth. I heard a doctor say once that if a man had to go through the pains and rigors of childbirth, the population of the world would be greatly reduced. <laughs> and probably so. You know, I remember I graduated from high school with a young man. He was my dear friend. His name was Johnny Waters. And uh, Johnny was uh, kind of a different sort of kid. He was kind of a lone ranger. He didn't have a lot of close friends. Johnny was stout, well-built, muscular. No doubt in my mind, Johnny was tough enough. He could have participated in athletics, but he didn't. He didn't play football. He didn't play basketball. He didn't run track. He didn't fight in the golden gloves. He didn't do any of that. He was very quiet when all the rest of us were hoofing it down the road and didn't have anything but a bicycle for wheels. Johnny had a brand new Chevrolet pickup that his dad bought him. You know, they, his dad gave him everything a kid could want, I guess. I liked Johnny and I was over at his house one day and he and I were talking and I just asked him, I said, Johnny, you spend so much time studying, you never participate in any of the activities at the school, and I've always wondered, why don't you participate? Johnny told me a story. He said, you know, Gene, my dad has shared this with me, that my mother died giving child in giving birth to me when she was uh, pregnant. And uh, when she was on the table after the birth, she said to me, his name was Jonathan, said, Jonathan, I want you to promise me that you will raise our son so that he will be a success in life and that he will be well taken care of. Mr. Waters had told his son, I promised your mother I'd do that. I said, son, I've tried to give you what you need. I've tried to love you. I've tried to take care of you. 
And Johnny told me, he said, you know, I could never ask for more than my dad has given me. And he said, I don't have time for those kind of things. I need to make my studies the best I can. Johnny graduated valedictorian in our class. He went to Texas A&M, and he became a veterinarian. He moved back out to West Texas and opened a veterinarian practice in Pecos, Texas. Very successful. Johnny later married to a young lady who grew up right down the road from him. They are members of the First Baptist Church in Pecos, and he served as a deacon there, and is a faithful man of God. And I thought many times about Johnny Waters. Johnny said, my dad has done so much for me, and my mother sacrificed her life for me, and I feel like I must be about the business of serving the Lord as best I can. That's a nice thing. The love of a mother causes a lot of things. And uh, here in this, I take my hat off to Johnny Waters. Johnny is probably 78 years old by now, and as far as I know, he is still very active both in his veterinarian practice and in the church over there. Sometimes we get more concerned about physical things than we are spiritual. Have you ever noticed that? We get more concerned about what kind of house we live in, what kind of clothes we wear, what kind of car we drive, what kind of bank account we have. We get concerned about popularity, who our friends are, and we get concerned about recreation and vacations and recognitions and all those things. And Jesus just says this, folks. He says, a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Life is not in any of those things. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Life is in Christ. And we can fume and we can be ambitious and we can look, what's for me? What's for me? But in essence, it all comes back. It's the Lord who ought to be primary in our life. Billy Sunday, great evangelist. Back in the early 1900s, 1910, 1915, right in through there, he'd been a baseball player and he met the Lord on a street corner one day as a man preached and gave his heart to the Lord and he went into evangelism. And he was hellfire and damnation preacher. He was preaching in Paris, Illinois, under the tent, and one night after the service was over, and Sunday was getting ready to go back to the hotel where he was staying, and there was a young man who was standing around, and he began to talk to this young man, well-dressed, intelligent young boy, and he began to talk to him about Jesus, and he asked him if he was a Christian, and the young man said, No, I'm not. And he talked to him about the Lord and tried to get him to make a commitment to Christ, but he wouldn't. And he asked him about his family. He said, Your dad, is he a Christian? Well, he said, My dad goes to church. Does your dad ever talk to you about the Lord? He said, well, no, sir, he never has talked to me about church or the Lord. He said, what about your mother? Well, my mother goes to church and she teaches Sunday school. 
said, do you have other members of the family? Yes, I have a sister. Is she a Christian? Well, she's a member of the church. My mother, my dad, my sister are all members. You're not a Christian, son. No, I'm not. He said, and your parents never talk to you about Jesus. He said, Mr. Sunday, do they think I'm lost? That's a thought, isn't it? Do you think people that don't know Jesus Christ are lost? There are people that are members of the church that are lost. You see, the church doesn't dispense salvation. It's not gained by taking the sacrament or the Lord's Supper is not gained by baptism. It's not gained by our benevolent giving to the cause of Christ. It's not. It only comes through faith in Christ. If we want people to be saved, that's where the answer is. You know, we could ask Riz Pa. Riz Pa, you're guarding the bodies. You've been here four months. The bodies have decayed and they're about to fall down out of the tree. And you still here. She said, I can't go off and leave them. People would talk about me. People would talk. Could I tell you, dear ones, talk is cheap. There's a lot of people that talk. There's a lot of people that they put their tongue in overdrive and their brain in neutral. And they have a lot to say. You know, the word gossip doesn't appear in the Greek New Testament, but there's some words very close to it. Words such as murmur. Murmur. And this is what the Lord says, he says, do all things without murmuring. Criticism, grumbling, there's a lot of things that come down. And God says, don't grumble among yourselves in John 6, 42. James 4, 11 says, Speak not evil one of another. <laughs> My. James 3 5 says the tongue is a small part of the body, but it boasts great things. You know, the tongue, it's kind of like taking the muffler off a car. When you put the muffler on, you can't hear the car, but you take it off. My, it's a big roar. That's what a lot of times our tongue is like that. The tongue is a fire, a very world of iniquity. It defiles the whole body and is set on fire of hell. You know, the God's Word tells us in the book of James, he that bridleth not his tongue. Hmm. Put a bridle on. Stop it. He goes on to say, With our tongue we bless the Lord and we curse men, and from the same mouth come both blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things should not be. You know, I remember when I was much younger, I was teaching school and coaching in my hometown where I'd grown up. I was preaching at the time, and I was teaching ninth and 10th graders, freshmen and sophomores in, in high school, and I noticed one thing. There was a lot of Catholic kids in the whole school, a lot of Catholic people in the whole town. And I remembered Elisha of Mary and them. Billy Pounds and Joe Salzer and Anastasio Gonzalez and Gregorio Rodriguez and Madeline Williams and Hesiosita Gonzalez and 
I could go on and remember those kids and they were all Catholic and you know, we would get to talking and those kids could quote the catechism. Man, they knew that thing. They had studied it. They were fluent. Could speak of the, the word of God in their church. And I got to noticing one thing. You know who the most illiterate kids in the school were? The Baptists. You know, they, we just don't seem to put a premium on remembering the Word of God. That's why I love Awana, folks. It teaches the Scripture. And by it, people come to know Jesus. Rizpa. She was so concerned about these bodies that she stayed there and fought the beasts off to keep them whole. We can ask the seven young men hanging on those ropes if they can answer, why are y'all there? You know what they'd say? We're there for the sins of our father. Our dad had done some things and they're holding us accountable for it. What a horrible way to be. These young men, no doubt, educated, no doubt, good family tree, had all the promise of being good, good citizens and they're not there because they murdered or stole or raped or got drunk or they were liars or they were homosexual. They weren't there because of immorality. They weren't juvenile delinquents. They were there because Saul violated a promise that he had made and they were holding them accountable for their doubt. You know what Saul's dying testimony was? When Saul came to die, here's what he said. I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will not harm you again because my life was precious in your sight. Behold, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Saul said, I have have really fouled up. His sons are hold, held accountable because their dad was godless and unfair in his life. You know, there's a lot of kids go through life with a handicap that's not physically visible and it's not something that they were born with. It's the way their mothers and dads were. I remember a young lady that when I was teaching school was in my class and I just happened to live right across the street from her most of her life. Their last name was Shoemate. God bless Margie's little old heart. Her dad was an alcoholic. Her dad was constantly in and out of jail, in and out of trouble with the law. Their mother wasn't much different than her dad. And that girl was raised up in that kind of thing. When she was 15, she was declared juvenile delinquent. She was over in the city park in the midnight hour posing in the nude for a photographer, was found guilty of that, was found guilty of being a prostitute, was found guilty of alcoholism. I knew Margie. I went down to see her when they had her in the juvenile detention. You know, folks, I have to apologize to Margie because 
I had been right there in the shadow of her house and watched her grow up, and I never really took time to go talk to her. And neither did anybody else that I know of. You know, kids need an example. They need to know somebody cares. Rizpah's boys ended up because of the sin of their father. Shame and disgrace. I would have you go to another hill. It has a hill that didn't have seven hanging by a rope. It had three hanging on a cross. Go to Calvary. Go and stand at Calvary and look up at those three crosses and say, why are you here? And one of those guys on the right, a thief, a vagabond, a robber, a murderer, guilty of sedition, a traitor to his country. And he would say, we indeed receive justly for our deeds. We deserve what we're getting. The wages of sin is death, folks. It still is. And we can say, why are you here? We are here because we live a life and it brought condemnation and they put us to death for our sin. And then he would point to the sinner cross and say, but him, he's not here because he's done something wrong. He's done nothing to me. You know why Jesus hung on the cross? Yes, you know, as well as I. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, who himself bear our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live unto righteousness for by his stripes we are healed. Christ died like that so you and I could live. So we might be saved. 2 Corinthians 5.21 said, For he has made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wow. What a gift God gives us. The book of Hebrews says this man, Jesus, has offered one sacrifice for sin once and for all and is set down at the right hand of God and ever lives to make intercession for us. You see, you go to the hill and watch that woman. Why are you doing this, Rizpa? I'm doing it because I love my children. Go and ask the boys hanging on those ropes, why are y'all here? We're here because our fathers sinned and they've held us accountable for it. And you go to the cross of Calvary and say, Jesus, why did you do that? I did it for you. That you might be forgiven of your sin. And all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Do you do that? Do you do that? Is there people around you that you have yet to express concern that they might know the Lord? We're going to invite you in just a moment to make a decision if you're here and you have never trusted in Jesus Christ, we invite you this morning. Come, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. Come and do that. We invite you. You're a Christian. You need a church home. We invite you to come in any way this church receives members. By baptism, by transfer of membership, by statement of faith, we invite you to do that. You're here this morning. They say, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I need the forgiveness of the Lord in my life. And I need to be 
dedicated to the Lord Jesus. We invite you to come and meet the Lord all over again that you might be cleansed and made useful in his service. We're going to sing what, Tom? 487. Number 487. While we sing this hymn, if you need to make a decision for the Lord Jesus, would you do it? Would you come today and say, yes, Lord, thy will be done while we stand and sing.